Hello everyone, welcome to PNU 201, Utility Meter Data Analytics and Quick Start Walkthrough. I'm Joe Beer, the Worldwide Technical Leader for AWS's Power and Utilities Vertical. And with, with me today is Sasha Rodekamp, one of our solution architects for our utility customers in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. Sasha was also our technical lead for the MDA Quick Start. In today's session, you're going to learn about how AWS Data Lakes, AI, and ML are helping utilities unlock the value of their smart meter data and see a walkthrough of our new quick start. So let's get started now with a look at our agenda. I'm gonna start things off here with number one, diving into why utility uh, are interested in smart meter analytics, what the ex customer expectation gaps and value gaps have been, and how an AWS data lake approach helps utilities close those gaps. I'm also gonna to touch on the benefits over a traditional legacy MDM and highlight a few of the customers that are gaining benefits today from running their analytics on AWS. Sasha then is gonna cover items two through four, diving into what's inside the QuickStar and how it works, summarizing benefits, and then letting you know how you too can quickly get started. So let's take a look now with the situation that utilities are in today. In a true Amazonian fashion, we're gonna look backwards through the eyes of a customer about what the biggest expectation gaps have been. So there's a lot of studies out there like the one referenced here and they all surface the same thing. Utilities, uh, their customers want to save money on their utility bill. That's what the big expectation is. And when you look at these top three items, you'll notice that they all require a fair amount of insights into energy usage. In fact, to get your wheels spinning further in this space, let's take a look here quickly at this mock-up of a unusual energy usage screen or UEU in utility speak that a utility may provide on the website or mobile app. Up at the top, you see that expectation number three is met, and that's providing the predicted energy usage and the predicted bill, which is gonna be higher than, than normal. And then down below, expectations one and two are met with the recommendations on the actions or the products or services that a customer could undertake to mitigate that high bill. So pretty useful information, right? And you would think that utilities would be doing this for everybody. Well, unfortunately, they're not. And it's very rare. You know, there's 750 million more meters out there now, smart meters. They've been out there for 20 years. And so you think by now utilities would have gotten the hang of using the data from these. But that hasn't been the case. As this recent study here in January 2020 shows, that this is still the case today. And utilities are missing the boat in capitalizing on this rich set of, of data. So where I wanted to go here was to let you know that this is the same lament, not just the study points out, but utilities around the world have the same issue and they tell us about this all the time. They wanna unlock that value from their smart meter data. So let's look at the situation they're in today and those value add use cases they wanna unlock. So the meter data flows from the meter to the head end into the MDM where a little bit of customer data gets mixed in with it to produce what all utilities must, which is the billing determinant. And this is the information needed so they can produce a bill. Sometimes they're doing these other use cases such as load forecasting and outage notification, outage reporting. Fair amount of utilities do that. Almost no one is doing these higher level use cases though, such as using that information for rate pricing and optimization, volt var optimization, DER planning, and God forbid they're actually using that information to make it easier for utility customers to switch. Utilities don't want to do that, especially in competitive environments, but by regulation, they often have to let customers switch within, say, a 24-hour period. And if they use this data effectively, they can do that at a very low cost in an automated manner. So if you put a AWS data lake in the picture and our high-quality analytics in ML, then you can unlock all these use cases. And you're gonna see a bit of that when Sasha shows you the quick start. But you may be asking, well, why can't utilities do this today with their existing data lakes or their existing MDM, sorry. Uh, there's big differences here, starting with the difference in design paradigms. So a traditional MDM is architected around a relational database and they've been optimized for storing the daily meter read data. They've been tweaked over time to also include the interval data little bit of customer data, but really not much else. And so they can't do the things that utilities want to do, such as energy disaggregation. And they certainly can't do any near real-time analytics in there. Versus a data lake approach, which is architected um, to handle any type of data, any speed, any volume. 
coming in at batch or streams. So this means you can put all your sub interval, sub hour interval data in there, and you can do real time operations as well. Cost difference. So because the traditional MDMs are built on usually old school legacy databases such as Oracle, they tend to be pricey. You're paying for that licensing. They're usually on prem, so you've got that cost. Plus, you've got the cost of the MDM itself. Versus a data lake based approach on top of S3, which is very low cost, and handling any data you want, any speed, any volume. Other differences are related to data retention capabilities. Again, back to cost. Because the more data you put in a traditional data lake, your price is going to go up with hardware, licensing, etc. That's usually causing you to not keep all your data in there at full resolution, and you only keep the data that's needed for billing purposes or what's required by regulation. All that non-consumption data is usually not even kept or thrown away after a short period of time. Versus the data lake approach, purpose-built databases, pay-as-you-go, serverless, AI, ML, and Lambda functions makes it very low cost to run your analytics on a data lake. And finally, the data processing and integration approach. Traditional MBMs are usually standalone. They don't integrate easily with other things. And um, the data tends to be processed in batches just because the legacy style of how utilities operate with that 24-hour billing cycle, the MDMs operate the same way. Versus an AWS Data Lake approach, data can be processed in real time in batch. You're probably going to use a handful of services to create this, as you're going to see in the quick start. All those services natively talk to each other, and you can integrate them with just a few clicks of your mouse. So this allows you then to do real-time operations. You can provide much more immediate feedback to your utility customers internally, as well as external customers for things like what's going on with the uh, volt var within the grid. And you can also provide the near real-time feedback to customers on energy usage, which is terrific for, uh, for instance, prepay billing. If you want to show customers in hourly increments, the energy they're using and the cost on their bill. So here's that glimpse I was talking about of the customers that are using uh, or running their meter data analytics right now on AWS. There's many more than just the six shown here. And um, just yesterday, in fact, Portland General Electric gave their talk at reInvent about how they too are doing their meter data analytics on AWS and saving a considerable amount of money doing so as well. So these customers you see here, they've all built their solution a little bit differently. And last year we started getting a big uptick though in customers asking for a common best practice way to do this. And because we're customer obsessed, we listened to our customers and we went ahead and created and published our meter data reference architecture, our meter data analytics reference architecture. That was pretty darn popular. In fact, it was downloaded 600 times in the first three months it was published. The customers still wanted an easy way to get started. They wanted an easy way to build a data lake using that reference architecture. And so we created the meter data analytics quick start. For that part of the story, my friends, I'm going to turn the reins over to Sasha Rodekamp, who will tell you all about that. Take it away, Sasha. Thanks, Joel, and hi. My name is Sasha. I'm a solutions architect based in Germany. And after Joe has talked about the why, I'm not going to walk with you through our MDA architecture and the different components to show you how the platform is built. However, before diving into this, let's first discuss quick starts, what they are, and especially on which features we have focused for our initial release. So quick starts are our automated gold standard deployments, which gets built by AWS solution architects and or partners, and they should accelerate your journey to the cloud by reducing the manual steps that needs to get going to get a solution started. Quick starts usually come with batteries included, means we are delivering the cloud formation templates, the necessary business logic, as well as documentation that helps you to deploy the quick start and adjust it to your needs. So for our initial version, we decided to take the meter reads directly from the MDM. The meter data management systems send meter reads to the data lake, usually once or twice a day in batches. We then pull in customer information from the CIS and have our, our, our analytics platform on top of the data lake. This analytics platform comes with different built-in algorithm, algorithms to demonstrate the potential use cases like predictive outage planning, load forecasting, 
and energy usage alerts. These algorithms enable four initial use cases. Of course, the actual energy usage consumption, which can be retrieved via the API. Then we have forecasting of energy consumption, and we are using a machine learning driven approach to forecast energy consumption on a household level based on learned usage patterns. The third one would be creating unusual usage alerts, and this can be built on top of our anomaly detection. We are scanning incoming meter reads continuously for anomalies, which can then be relayed to unusual, unusual usage. Last but not least, we have momentary outage maps to visualize outage clusters. So the API enriches outages and error codes with geo information, which then can be used to plot everything on a map to visualize these outages. Quick starts are usually open source, so all aspects can be modified and expanded, and you can build additional machine learning or analytics capabilities on top of the foundational ones to adjust everything to your needs. And now it's time to talk about architecture, and let's start with a 50,000 feet view from above. As I've already have mentioned, we are taking the meter reads from the MDMs, but we're also pulling in the weather information and the customer information. Due to the nature of the MDMs, they traditionally talk via FTP. We are using AWS transfer for FTP to bring the meter reads from the MDM to the data lake, but you can also use AWS Data Sync or AWS Storage Gateway. The data lake itself consists of several S3 buckets and we're using AWS Glue, our serverless ETL engine, to transform the data between the stages. We are then having Amazon Athena to query data directly from the S3 buckets and we're bringing the data to Redshift, our data warehouse, to slice and dice the meter reads even further. We also feed the meter reads to our machine learning pipeline to continuously train our model. To consume the meter reads, we are deploying an API gateway, which gives third parties and um, our users the possibility to read the metadata and load the forecasts. We also provide a Jupyter notebook, which um, enables our more data science focused customers to elaborate the meter reads even further. So from this overview, I want to dive with you into the different aspects of our architecture. And we start with a detailed look on our data lake. As I've already have said, the data lake consists of several S3 buckets. We have a landing zone, a clean zone, and a business zone. The landing zone is the entry point of the data lake. So the MDM sends their raw data, their raw meter reads to this landing zone. The landing zone contains um, this raw data and the data remain just untouched. Then we have the clean zone and the clean zone holds the data in a more standardized format. So we transform the data to our internal schema and normalize date fields. The task of this first glue job is then that no matter what the MDM delivers, it will get transformed to our standardized internal format. So with that, we are independent from the format of the MDM and you don't have to adjust the data structure of your data in the MDM. You just have to adjust this first glue job to map your data format to our internal one. We then have the business zone and this provides the meter reads in the right granularity and format that they can be accessed efficiently. So you can think of the business zone like a business friendly view on your meter reads. And the task of the second glue job is then to partition the meter reads by reading type and reading date and store them in Parquet, which is a column based compressed file format. This all helps us to provide the data in, in a way which suits our downstream systems best. And decoupling the business zone from the landing zone has the advantage that when new use cases emerge, we just create a new business zone, take the normalized data from the clean zone and store them in a representation which matches our access patterns and requirements best. After we have 
process the data to this business friendly view, we finally push everything to Redshift and this is also done via a glue job. Another part of our ETL pipeline is the aggregation branch and here we take our meter reads and aggregate them on a daily, weekly and monthly basis and store them on S3. And that's the right point to talk about late data. So when we say late data, we mean that this happens when a meter can't deliver a read at the expected point in time. That may be due to a network problem or a defect in the meter. However, when the meter is back working again, it will re-deliver this missed read at a later point in time. Take this as an example. So on day one, we have the 1st of January. Um, we are getting reads from all our meters as expected. On day two, um, the 2nd of January, the orange meter seems to have a defect. So we are only getting meter reads from the green and the blue meter. Then finally on day three, the 3rd of January, we have again uh, the orange meter working and we get the expected reads from the green, the blue and the orange one for the third. But we also get an additional read from the orange meter for the 2nd of January. And that's what we call late data. The task of the ETL pipeline now is to sort this additional meter read from the third into the right partition and re-aggregate all the aggregated values um, based on this new information that, that has been arrived. And how do we doing that? So we are creating a temporary file which gets created from the first glue job and is valid for one ETL pipeline run. And this file stores a distinct list of our meter reads. So on the first day, this file would just contain one entry, the 1st of January, because we're just getting reads from the 1st of January. On day two, this file then would just store another entry and this would be the 2nd of January because we're just getting reads for the 2nd of January. On day three then, we get two entries in this file for the 3rd of January and the 2nd of January because on this third day, we're getting this additional read for the 2nd of January. The pipeline now takes this file and on the first day it knows that it only has to aggregate everything for the 1st of January. Likewise on the second day where it has only aggregate everything for the 2nd of January. Then on day 3 the pipeline aggregates everything for the 3rd and it will re-aggregate everything for the 2nd of January. And here we're just taking all the existing values plus our additional meter read create the aggregation and then overwrite existing values. So now we have stored data in a business friendly way. We have done some aggregation, even handled late data and put everything to Redshift. The next step would be to trigger our machine learning pipeline. And for that, we know that Glue writes each job state change to CloudWatch events. From there, we're forwarding everything to Amazon SNS, where we have a couple of subscribers. One of the subscriber is, is a Lambda function that reacts on the success notification of the last job. So, and this Lambda function then triggers our machine learning pipeline orchestrator. This pipeline orchestrator is responsible for all our machine learning related task and it is a state machine itself. And when we now dive into this machine learning pipeline orchestrator, we can see that this consists of another Lambda function and further state machines. And the task of this first Lambda function is to decide if a model needs to be trained or retrained. Of course, you need an initial model, but afterwards you need to decide if you want to train or retrain this model on a periodic basis or each time new metadata arrives to learn usage patterns as fast as possible. Then we are entering the upper branch and um, we are training or updating the model. If the model is up to date, we can enter the lower branch and here we pre-calculate anomalies and forecasts. But first, let's focus on the upper branch, so on the actual 
model training. And this state machine again starts with a lambda function. This lambda function prepares our meter reads and we also load some weather, weather information which we can relate to our meter reads. We then pass everything to SageMaker for the actual model training. And here we are using the DeepAR algorithm because DeepAR has the advantage that we can create one model jointly over all our meters instead of training one model for each meter. After the model has been trained, we can start our SageMaker endpoint to enable online inferences. So once the model is up to date, we can enter our lower branch and this is our state machine for the pre-calculation of anomalies and forecasts. But why we are doing this kind of pre-calculation. So imagine you have millions and millions of meters and you have the requirement to batch forecast all of them. When you now ask your SageMaker endpoint for a forecast for all of these meters, this endpoint can get overwhelmed very quickly. So it's much more efficient to just pre-calculate the forecast for a certain period of time and then store everything on S3 from where they can be accessed efficiently. And looking into the state machine, we see that we start again with a lambda function and this lambda function just splits the whole list of our meters into even sized batches that we can process them in parallel. The second lambda function is responsible for the anomaly detection. And here we're using a third party library which gives reasonable good results. After that, uh, we are using the SageMaker transform job, which calculates our forecast based on the trained model, which we have done before, and stores these results in a file. Afterwards, we can take the anomaly files and the forecast files and move everything to S3 from where, they, from where we can access them easily. Speaking of, um, now we have both the trained model and our pre-calculated anomalies and forecasts. Now we need a way to access them. And for that, we are deploying an API endpoint, which provides us access to our different sources, like the S3 bucket that contains our pre-calculated anomalies and forecasts, and we're using Amazon Athena to retrieve this data from S3. We provide also the possibility to um, ask our SageMaker endpoint for inter interferences of single meters and of course loading current and aggregated meter reads from Redshift. So beside the API gateway, the MDA comes with a Jupyter notebook that contains some example implementation and that should simply help you to get started exploring your meter reads further and eventually fulfill your data science tasks. But you can also use this notebook to plot some diagrams to visualize your meter readings, like the one you can see below, which shows our anomaly detection for a single meter over the course of one year. And if you are curious on how to get started, then it's simple as that. Just check out the MDA from our repository, have a look at the documentation, and this gives you the needed information and deployment options to bring everything to your account. Then take, take everything and just deploy the MDA to your account and you can use the provided meter reads to explore the platform even further. After you familiarize yourself with the MDA, just start building on top of it. And to wrap it up, let's have a look on the benefits for our different stakeholders groups. So first we have of course the customers and um, the customers usually expect a more per personalized engagement from their utilities, be it about their usage, how to save on their bill or simply how to make themselves more energy efficient. Then we have the utilities itself. And here we have a number of efficiency and cost reduction use cases that meter analytics supports, like predictive analytics on equipment failure, reducing unplanned outages, or 
just reducing energy theft. Finally, we have the retailers who may not own the actual meters, but they are getting the metering data. And they can use this data to understand their customers better, reduce customer churn by keeping customers happy with proactive engagements, or just mining the data for more insights to come up with new attractive rates, products, or services. And if you want to know more, here are some resources that point you to the reference architecture, the documentation, and of course the quick start itself. We hope you've enjoyed the session and that you're now eager to build your metadata analytics platform in the cloud. And if you have any further questions, do not hesitate to contact us. Thanks for watching.